Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a correction to the study I've talked about a few months ago when the Chinese astronomers claim to have discovered the so-called impossible black hole. Let's talk a little bit more about this and find out what exactly this object is and welcome to What The Math. So a few months ago I released a video where I talked about the study from China that actually described the discovery of the so-called impossible black hole. The black hole that shouldn't technically exist. Now, when it comes to black holes, we think that all kinds of black holes exist except for this very specific type, or more specifically, the uh, black hole of a certain mass. And here we're talking about a mass of about approximately 50 masses of the Sun, up to about 120 masses of the Sun. Now, this gap is created by the fact that we think when a star, such as for example the very well-known Eta Carina stars, when they explode, could technically explode completely. They shouldn't really leave any remnant behind. In other words, we usually refer to this as pair instability supernova. Basically, um, a certain star will explode entirely. It will create such a powerful supernova that nothing will be left behind. And from all of the calculations over the years, we established that black holes between the mass of about 50 to 120 masses really shouldn't be possible unless, of course, two smaller black holes collide. Now, when the original study came out back in December of 2019, the Chinese scientists speculated that what they've discovered was essentially a black hole known as LB1 that was about 70 or so masses of the Sun, and it was orbited by a, an, another object, by a star, and the star was possibly about 8 masses of the Sun. And all of this was established by trying to analyze the distance and analyze the orbital parameters of these two objects. But several follow-up studies that were released pretty much within a few weeks after the initial release all agreed that, well, it's very unlikely that this 70 masses of Sun black hole exists. As a matter of fact, several scientists established that there were at least two major problems with the study. The first one was that the distance was overestimated. It's very likely that the distance to this system was not over 4,000 light years as originally proposed, but a lot uh, closer to us, possibly about 2,000, maybe 2,500. At the same time, many scientists suggested that if there was a black hole of this type, and it was also orbited by a very massive, very bright star that we can actually see, it's very likely that this system would have a lot of various, very easily observable emissions, such as, for example, X-ray emissions, and nothing was observed from this direction. So either this was a completely unusual and unique object that we've never seen before, which is kind of unlikely, or these old studies were making a good point, that this was not an impossible black hole at all. And the most recent study decided to investigate this even more thoroughly by actually looking at the emission spectra of what's really happening around the star itself. Not the black hole because we can't really see it, but the star. And they wanted to analyze what is the star made out of, because this is something we can use to establish what sort of a system this is. And the scientists behind the study you can find in the description below did a very very thorough analysis of all of the elements inside of the star. And pretty much right away they discovered something really really unusual. There was quite a lot of helium emitted from the surface of this star. And that's something we really don't expect to see in most of the stars. Mostly because obviously for the most part the top of the star, all of the surface here, should be hydrogen. The helium and other materials like oxygen and carbon are inside of the star and this is where essentially the burning itself happens. Basically if you were to look at our sun, the actual nuclear reaction, the fusion of hydrogen into helium happens inside the core. And all of the energy then propagates to the radiative zone, but everything here on the surface is hydrogen. And a lot of this hydrogen actually stays as hydrogen and never really gets used up. This is why our sun in a sense is not particularly efficient as are a lot of other really large stars. So all of our sun's helium is inside the core. We're not going to be able to see it if we look at the sun. So how is it that we're seeing helium coming from this unusual object? What's going on here? Well, there are certain stars known as helium stars. There are even stars known as extreme helium stars. And these objects, for the most part, are not really created normally. 
We think there are several ways that they can be usually created. One of them is, of course, if two smaller objects, like for example, a typical white dwarf, such as nearby Sirius B, or essentially what our sun will become one day, collides with another white dwarf, and because they do contain a lot of helium and a lot of things like oxygen and carbon, they can initiate um, helium to helium fusion and generate a completely new star. Basically, they start the burning reaction by combining the material from two separate objects. If their mass is less than about 1.3, 1.4 masses of the sun, they don't explode, they don't go supernova, they just create a relatively active, very bright, very hot, but also um, helium or extreme helium star that also burns really quickly. It actually um, uses up its energy relatively fast. But then there's another way, and this is what the scientists think may have happened here. The other way is if a typical star essentially gets all of its outer shell, all of its hydrogen slowly, slowly sucked away by the object orbiting around it. Now, this could be a neutron star, this could also be a black hole, it can also be a white dwarf, and even a typical, uh, slightly more massive star can do this as well. Essentially, anything can be this, you can call it vacuum cleaner, that sucks up all of the hydrogen and exposes the inner core, the helium core. And then what remains behind, if the star was initially big enough, is a helium star that now starts burning helium and creates a lot of energy that way. And the thing is, the scientists behind this paper believe that this is exactly what they're observing here. Basically, it's a stripped helium star, and it's more likely that if this is a stripped helium star, that it's not going to be as massive as reported by the Chinese scientists. The actual um, estimates, at least according to all of the other models of helium stars we have, is that the star itself probably has a very similar mass to our own sun, maybe a little bit more massive, about 10% more massive, and the object around which the star orbits, the object known as LB1, could be about 2 to 3 masses of the sun. In other words, it's either a really, really tiny black hole, which is very unlikely, or more likely, it's some sort of a neutron star, or possibly even just a regular star that's not very bright. So in other words, this could be any object, really absolutely any object out there, even just like a really, really dim star that's very difficult for us to see, and this star has about two to three masses of the sun. Although the current assumption is that it's probably a neutron star, and it's a neutron star that's not active yet, simply because of the distance between these two objects. But don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that this is not an exciting system. It's still an exciting system simply because of the star that they discovered. These so-called helium stars, or the extreme helium stars, are very rare, and we do want to understand how they form, and what exactly happens to these stars at the end of their lives. For now, we don't unfortunately have enough of them to analyze, and because we believe their formation is such a rare event, it's a lot more interesting for us to discover a helium star than it is to discover invisible and potentially not even real black hole that's out there. And because most scientists pretty much agree that the black hole itself very likely either doesn't exist or is a lot smaller than initially reported, in this case, it's really all about the star itself. And since the scientists definitely saw the signs of helium on the surface, this really makes it more likely to be a helium star than anything else. If this system has a helium star that's a lot more massive than a typical helium star, that's even more interesting to us than a black hole. It really just raises a lot more questions about how stars are created, how stars survive, and how such unusual stars can even form in these binary systems where we don't really expect them to exist. But I think the most important lesson out of all of this is the scientific process. And this is actually really the main goal for this channel. My goal here is to try to explain how the scientific approach works and how most scientists would never really say something with an absolute fact. Today we understand that the only certainty is the uncertainty. And the way that we learn things and the way we understand things is by trying to see and analyze the world around us, making a few assumptions, trying to understand if this is exactly how the world works, and testing various theories. And if those theories come out true, then, well, I guess maybe this is how the world works. But if those theories come out wrong, then we have to abandon the ideas and try to come up with something else. This is probably the most important way of analyzing the world around us. And honestly, people that often make very strong statements and even live by those statements are very often unfortunately wrong. It's not really the way that we're meant to learn about the world around us. There's absolutely no way we can say something with certainty today, because there's a very big chance that things that we're saying with certainty today might be completely wrong in the future. 
I mean, think about these science in the past 200 years. In the past 200 years, our science has changed completely. What we believe to be true, like for example Newtonian principles, today are seen as, in some sense, uh, not particularly satisfying. Einstein's theories are good, but once again, there is still things missing there. So we need to constantly challenge ourselves and try to revise our theories at all times. And this doesn't just include science, it includes pretty much everything around us. This is really how I try to live my life, and it is sometimes difficult to not know things for certain, but eventually you kind of get used to it. But anyway, so on that note, check out the studies I mentioned in the description below. Once we discover a little bit more about the system and find out if it's really some sort of a strange and unusual object, or if it's a helium star that's generated in some way or another, we'll make sure to follow this up with another video. For now, that's it. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you still haven't. Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. And come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Maybe support this channel Patreon. It does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.